Opre Roma! Hello to everybody. Yavetsa Stepa Tale. The greeting in Rome. I'm Valdemar Karini, a Romani poet and translator originally from Belarus. Gretan Paxson and I are going to take you on a journey to the 1971 World Romani Congress. In the decade before the Congress, I was in Ireland on the run from the British Army. I was living in a wagon on a bit of land in Kilmainham. And about a week after I'd been there, the Dublin Corporation's chief bailiff, who we call Big Bill, ordered me to shift. And it was that that provoked me into going with some travelers on the same bit of land as me up to a piece of land near a factory on the Ring Road. And that's really how it all started. They evicted us 10 times from different bits of land. We were stuck on a back road just outside the city. In effect, the Dublin Corporation managed to expel all the travellers out of Dublin, pretty much. And we were all parked up on this little piece of ground in a back lane. And we looked across at this wonderful meadow called Cherry Orchard, 26 acres, and suddenly decided we're going to open that gate and go in. And it was here that the travellers made their stand eventually. You can see me there helping to dig a ditch around the trailers at the side of the field, which was supposed to be our, our strong point in, in the event that the police turned up, the guards, as they say in Ireland. Of course, after all our preparations, it was a terrible shock and surprise when a whole battalion of guards turned up outside the fever hospital. And further down the road, they were unloading a lot of uh, young young men just out of the labor exchange to come up and act as bailiffs to get us off, off Jerry Orchard. It was a pretty critical time. Everybody on the camp came up to the fence and looked, looked as determined as possible. And I stepped out in the middle of the road and spoke to the chief of police. And I said, look, you just, just look at the people here. We're desperate. If you come into this camp, there'll be bloodshed. And then I went back behind the fence and waited a few minutes. And lo and behold, unbelievably, we saw this whole battalion of police form up, turn to the left, and march off down Ballyfermot Road, followed by a few breaking milk bottles and a few stones and bars that followed them down the road. And that was the end of it. Of course, it wasn't the end of it in one sense, because the whole issue was then taken to court but it meant that we had a big breathing space and it all ended up with Dublin Corporation for us having to provide an alternative to Cherry Orchard Camp. Here's the second St. Christopher's School that we built at Cherry Orchard. It was in fact about as much as a year after the burning of the one, the Ring Road, where you can just see the face of, of my partner at the time, Venice Manley, whose idea it was to have a school and she was the chief initiator of it and a teacher, although she wasn't a trained teacher herself. Children loved St. Christopher's because they couldn't get into the local school. They weren't allowed into the local school. And it, St. Christopher's, you couldn't get them out of the school. It must have been a whole year went past at Cherry Orchard. We went through a very severe winter. And then one day, a taxi pulled up outside the camp and a little man got out. I call him a little man, but he was a very important person. That man was actually Ionel Rotar a refugee from Moldova, an artist and writer who did community work with the Rudari Roma in Paris. To get publicity, he had staged his own mock coronation by Rudari and Usari Roma as Vida Voivod III. Under this persona, he built up a campaign to demand reparation for the Roma Holocaust. Other campaigners joined him, Jacques de Verne and his brother, who took the name Vainko and Loyla Ruda. Vida Voivod and they built up the Comité International Sagani in France. It was because of Vida Voivod that Irish travellers joined Comité International Sagani, and Vanko came to England in 1966 
for the foundation of the Gypsy Council. They urged me to come back to England and start an organization in Britain, which was supposed to be called the Travers Community. When I got back to London or south of London, I was called out by uh, a great traveler called Joe Eastwood. And they were just about to be evicted on what we used to call the debris, one of the old bomb sites near St. Mary Street. And uh, in one of my quirky moments, I put on a suit and took an, a rolled umbrella with me. And on a, I said, oh, I'm just here. I said this to the, to the councilmen. I said, look, I'm just here to um, observe what you're doing because I've been sent over by the Home Office to see how, how you conduct these evictions. So they looked pretty surprised, but they brought up a digger. And I thought, oh, well, this is a real crisis now. So I put aside my umbrella and we all sat on the drawbar of this trailer and uh, stopped the eviction. Opre Roma! The Gypsy Council was formed on Human Rights Day, 1966. And I'd gone around to the owner of the pub or manager of the pub and given him 10 quid to hire the room at the back of the pub. And I said this was for a human rights meeting. Because as I walked out of the pub and looked around, I saw on the, on the front porch, no gypsies. So that was a, a kind of an ominous sign. But anyway, about 40 people turned up for the meeting and there was no way he could cancel the, the contract I had with him. And uh, there was Banco Ruda, who was one of the chief people again, who met me in France. And Peter Ingram was there and a lot of lo local travelers from, from the Kent, Kent area. We handed out green cards which said Travelers Community. But one of the people from East London, that was Johnny Brazil, he said, why don't we have our own council? And why should it not be the Gypsy Council? And that's how, how the name stuck. I got involved with Romney people in 1967, when as a young student, I read about the foundation of the Gypsy Council in December 1966. And I rang up Grattan to come and speak to a group of anti-racist students at Oxford. At the end of his lecture, he called for volunteers and I volunteered to help run the very first Gypsy Council summer caravan school on an unlicensed illegal encampment. You've got to do a proper run, you child. I mean, with these gorgeous, as we call you, they live in house, they're brought up to schooling. They know what schooling is. But you put our child into a classroom and see how pretty it is, especially if there's a green field beside of them. This school we like because we draw, paint, write, anything we can do. The new Gypsy Council held many public protests. This one outside Parliament in 1967 was the first since 1951, when Norman Dodds MP invited Kent Gypsies to Westminster, including Jane Baker, aunt of a later Gypsy Council chair, Daniel Baker. In this picture you can see Peter Ingram, who later came to the 1971 World Romany Congress carrying the wagon. Another important action was the recurring campaign to preserve the Romani presence at absent races. Gypsy people had been having a great gathering on the down during the races since the 18th century. They had been encouraged by Queen Victoria, whose diaries record how she welcomed Romanies camping on the royal land at Windsor and later appointed the Welsh Romany John Roberts as her official harpist. Gypsy Council found the member, Jim Penhold, held a hereditary right to supply book, makers booths at the races. Then in 1967 came the bombshell news that after 200 years of Romanies gathering on the Downs during the races, the Conservators of Epsom Downs decided they were going to ban the Gypsies. So I got on a bus with Fred Wood, who was the chairman of the Gypsy Council at that time. We didn't know what the hell we were going to say to put some kind of pressure 
on the conservators to give us some kind of leverage to get, get us allowed to be there. So what we did is say, you're trying to ban us, but we're going to stop the Derby if you do that. <laughs> and amazing, this went out over the BBC and a lot of travellers caught hold of this idea and they were they came in in larger numbers than usual. I think they spent about four thousand pounds bringing special um, security guards to come around there, but it didn't, didn't make any difference because we were all over the place, up at Tattenham Corner, down by the fun fair. There were just travellers everywhere, so that they could see there was no way they were going to stop us. So we had another little meeting, and they put the price up to ten pounds a trailer or something like that, and we went along with that and. It, been going on ever since. It was the policy of the Gypsy Council who had one main strategy, which was to try to stop every major eviction that was threatened around the country at the time. We were called in by Pops Johnny Connors, and we all went up there in an old ambulance. There was Fred Wood with me, there was Dennis Mariner, a couple of other people. Roy Wells, I believe. My trailer was already up there, so we put that on the front line, we took the wheels off it, and we, of course, announced that we're not moving, but there was an overwhelming force of police. Between the police and council workmen, they were able to pull my trailer up somehow and put it on a low loader, and it was taken off down the motorway about five miles. And then gradually, you know, it looked like we were being defeated because they pulled all these 40 trailers out on the road and the whole road was blocked by trailers but what we said is we didn't put the trailers there council put us here we didn't call us blocked and thank goodness at that moment the the, the police agreed with that assessment of the situation and the council had to come back with their tractors and pull us back onto council land and that's how the battle of brown hills ended Paul Johnny composed a song about this great victory, the Ballad of Brown Hills, and that song is perpetuated in the Romano Drum song book produced after the Congress. That summer, after we'd got permission to, to stay on Epsom Downs, a lot of people assembled there for the Derby, as usual, and we were joined by Bernadette Devlin. Bernadette Devlin, was a young traveler from, from Ireland. Um, they're known collectively as the Delphi Devlins from Cookstown, Northern Ireland. And she became the youngest MP in Parliament. She was only 21 in the town, and she, she was an MP at that moment. There was an eviction at a place called Turkey Street in East London. There was only about 10 travelers there, so we didn't have much chance to, to stop an eviction. I had been asked to speak at the local technical school and Bernadette Devlin was there and she called out the entire student body so that out of that technical college came about 700 students and we all marched off to take over the local police station and we got right to the door uh, before the police managed to block our way and then had a big sit down in front protest against that eviction in Turkey Street. Tom Lee camped out in a little street, Charles Street, which is a street parallel with Downing Street, Whitehall. And he stayed overnight there. And it was a, quite a remarkable way of bringing attention to our cause at that time. The Gypsy Council then produced a newspaper called Romano Drome. It was a lot of quite interesting historical stuff in that first issue, including a column right down the front page by Ronald Lee, Romani Kai Jasamen, where, where are we going to? Which is maybe a question of, for today as well. Unfortunately, Ronald Lee missed the Congress because he returned to Canada short, shortly before it took place. He became the Canadian representative and was part of the delegation led by Yul Brenner that registered the new International Romani Union at the United Nations in 1979. After the first issue, designed by Peter Smith, 
a printer friend from Grattan Puxon's journalist days in Colchester. The editorship was taken over first by George Marriott, an Irish traveller and Labour councillor, who with his Romany comrade, Carlo Harry Smith, had been a prisoner of war in Nazi Germany. After George Marriott, the editorship was taken over by Jeremy Sanford, the famous author of Cathy Come Home and Edna the Inebriate Woman. He produced the Congress issues. All this time, in the late 60s, Grattan was working with the Comité International Rom in Paris to try and get an international conference, a World Romany Congress, off the ground. And it continually foundered because Banco Ruda was trying to get the UNESCO Palace in Paris as a venue, and we never quite managed it. I was then in Czechoslovakia uh, meeting some people at, at that time who, who were very much um, you know, on, on the kind of front line of things. That was Dr. Jan Sibula and Anton Fratsun and Brat Bratislava. He'd been a partisan hero. And they also wanted the Congress to take place. So when I came back to England and we felt that something had to happen, the Gypsy Council agreed to host the First World Romany Congress. They decided to basically bounce the Comité International of Cigar into having a Congress by organising a meeting in London to prepare for a Congress. But in fact, Grattan confided in me uh, that his plan all along was that if he could get enough people to come to this preparation meeting, he would declare it a Congress. It was long overdue that we had our first Congress, and even that uh, was threatened. At the last minute, we had to find a new location to hold it in secret. The World Romani Congress was held over the Easter weekend in 1971 at Kennock House near Oppington in Kent. How that came about, that we had anywhere to hold the Congress, was that Brian Raywood, traveller from Wales, was then working at that school. Grattan told me that he was looking for a venue and it was presenting enormous problems. He wanted some, uh, some British and Irish travellers to be there. What's to be done about the gypsies' encampment on the A2 near Dartford? They settled there when they were evicted from Darrenth Wood, Kent. And though the new site's a long way from being ideal, in fact it could hardly be more unsuitable, they're in no hurry to move. The authorities who got them out of Darrenth Wood made no other provision for them. So here's the extraordinary state of affairs, gypsies camped on a busy main road. I said to Grattan, maybe... I can get round Mr. Baker and he might, he might let us have the school in the Easter holidays. And he prevailed upon the headmaster, Mr. Baker, to let us have the premises for the Congress, dormitories, use of the kitchen, everything we needed. It, it was a wonderful thing. How I came to be at the World Romany Congress <laughs> Uh, was a fluke, really. Brian Raywood was a member of the Old Gypsy Law Society, and I'd recently tracked him down, and um, Brian said that this was going to happen, and I thought, well, I might as well pop down there. I pulled in to the car park at the school uh, with my motor and trailer. Tommy Lee had a trailer, uh, there were only the two trailers there. And I remember having a dustbin lid with three bricks uh, that I could light a fire on. It was an interesting couple of days. Before it started, Grattan had just confronted the leaders of the Comité International of Cigars, said that there were so many people coming, he'd already given out press releases saying that it was going to be the first World Romany Congress. Of course, they went along with it and the Comité International Cigar got renamed 
the Comité International Rome, uh, and people agreed at that point that Roma should be the umbrella title for all gypsies, Roma and travellers. Here is the Calderash Romani writer and evangelist Matteo Maximoff, camera in hand, with Grattan Puxen in front of Cannock House. Matteo only learned to read and write while interned in a Vichy concentration camp. He wrote the first account by Roma of the Holocaust in 1946 and had published two novels, Le Ursitori and Le Peri de la Liberté, based on the life of his grandfather and channeled family members of the last days of slavery in Romania. Maximov's own father was born into slavery. Switching from Catholicism to Pentecostalism in 1959, Maximov worked tirelessly to build links between the Committee International Sigani, later Rom, and the Roma Evangelical Church. During the Congress, he also worked tirelessly as a Romani translator during every plenary session. With all the different languages, which were floating about in the Congress because there were plenty of people that didn't speak Romanes in, in, in a fluent way. Donald Kendrick was like a key person there as a linguist. He, I don't know how many languages he spoke, but he didn't seem to be phased at any time from being able to translate across the table and, and keep the whole thing going. Opre Roma! <laughs> I was new in the movement. I heard about individuals uh, and now was getting to meet some of them. So for me, that, that gave me, uh, it, it drove me to, to decide to stay with the struggle with the Romani effort. During the Congress, delegates split up into commissions to study particular problems. Language, war crimes, culture, social affairs, and education. Slobodan Berbeski was, was an intellectual from Belgrade, from Belgrade in Yugoslavia. All the people that came from Yugoslavia were in a special position because they were able to to get their visas and travel freely. And Babeski had an important role after, after the Congress had elected him president, when he returned to, to Belgrade, he was the person who campaigned for a rising the status, a risen, uh, an improved status of Roma in Yugoslavia. So what Babeski did, um, through his influence, because obviously he was a member of the League of Communists and so on, was to get the status raised to, raise to Narod Nost, which was the next one up, which meant a nationality. Roma went from ethnic group to nationality. And this fitted very well with the aims of the Congress because the Congress had said, we are no longer gypsies, call us by our right name, Roma. Spike Abdi, the first Rom elected to the Macedonian parliament was a really key person in the Congress. He was a tough guy. He was son of a blacksmith, and he had he had the, the strength of strength of armor of a blacksmith himself. He was a strong character. And he said at the very last session, what I would want to do with you people, he said, it's not about feeding of the 5,000, like it says in the Bible, but to teach you, not to, not to give you fish to eat, but to teach you how to catch fish. And later on, when I was living at Shutka as his guest initially, he said to me confidentially that his party, which was the 
party for the full emancipation of Roma could one day become, if, if his ambitions were fulfilled, could, could become uh, a European-wide, even a global party. That was, that was Fike's, um, I, know, I hate to use the word dream, but that was, that was Fike's, that was Fike Abdi's intention, had he not later on had a lot of trouble himself and as we all did in Shudka. <laughs> Festival is accompanied by Indian music. A thousand sheep are sacrificed this evening to bring the gypsies good luck. Emin Ramadan is a spokesman for the gypsies here who want to be recognized in Yugoslavia as a national minority of Indian origin. This would give them the same rights and privileges as all other Yugoslav citizens. For that reason, they've rejected the name Gypsy in favor of Rom, Rom or Romani being a tribal name of Indian origin. Emin is also choreographer of the state Romani dance troupe. On every street, costume and music recall the Indian past of the Romani people. Gypsy community is quite unlike the rest of Yugoslavian society. They've managed to preserve their own identity and Indian culture, even when it's frowned on by the state. Dr. Yancy Bulu, by the time of the Congress, was uh, an exile in Switzerland, and therefore there was some tension between himself and the other members of the Czechoslovak Party, that was Thomas Holomak, particularly. He was um, a loyal communist, so he was praising the Communist Party um, in his speech, saying they'd done lots of good things for the Roma. Other people were puzzled by this and upset about it. Towards the end of the Congress, we set off in a coach up to Birmingham for the purpose of a protest at Walsall police station because there'd been the burning of three children in a caravan that had been pulled off Slacky Lane and put onto George Street. And that protest was led very powerfully by, by uh, Thomas Holomack because he was a, a military prosecutor. So he had a pretty stern uh, air about him. Before we went to the police station, we had this ceremony on Bolsol Heath where we lit a fire. We set fire to a tent in the old style way of tradition amongst Romani people of uh, marking somebody's death. But this was to mark the death of 
half a million Roma in, in, the, in the genocide of the Second World War. On the way back in the bus, Jaco Jovanovic set about writing fresh lyrics for the what became the Roma national from Jalem Jalem. So that that work was done. He was writing it there on a jolting bus as we came back to London. Uh, Juan de Dios Ramirez Heredia was a young lawyer from Barcelona. His role in the Congress was of great importance because there was had been for a long time really a kind of alienation between the Roma Calais of, of the uh, the Iberian Peninsula and those big communities in Eastern Europe. We, we were divided. In fact, what the whole Congress was about was to somehow overcome the Cold War and break down the the barriers of, of the Iron Curtain. What Juan de Diaz brought to the Congress was that special connection between the Roma of Eastern Europe and the Roma of Spain and Portugal. Later on, he became the first Rom to be elected to the European Parliament and has headed the Romany Union in Spain for all his years. W. R. Rishi was an attache at the High Commission in London and came as a private person to the Congress. He had acted as an interpreter for Khrushchev in discussions between the Indian government and, and the Russian government. It came from him that we should show the historic ties with India by embossing the Romani flag of pre-war years, which was simply blue and green, that it should be embossed with what he called the Ashok Chakra, a wheel very similar to the flag on the on the Indian national flag. So that's how we came to adopt the big red wheel on the Romani flag. One of the few women's delegates and the lone voice for the city Roma at the Congress was Melanie Spitter. Melanie Spitter was a young Sintitza from Frankfurt in Germany. She played a great part in the Congress linking us with the, the Sinti people of Germany and France. And I learned later that uh, a lot of her family had died in Auschwitz. And she was born just after the war and grew up in, in very dire, dire circumstances. Later on, Melanie Spitter became, or had a career, let's say, as a filmmaker and spent many years exposing what had happened to, to her people in, in the Nazi era. Opre Roma! As part of the Congress, a festival was held on Parliament Hill Fields, the southern tip of Hampstead Heath. The festival could not have happened without the help of a group of architectural students who designed and directed the inflatable enclosure. One of the notable woman delegate was Raya Pilenberg. She had been an actress at the Roman Theatre in Moscow. One evening, Jarko came to the Cabaret Etoile de Moscou, where I was working, and he, had, he brought a young uh, Englishman, an English guy, uh, named uh, Grattan Paxson, with him. And uh, they wanted uh, us to join uh, uh, his work and to go to London uh, to take part in the festival and I should be an organizer and she should be a star of the show. Her presence at the Congress caused quite a stir. I remember her arriving at the door and, the, and we kind of collected around her because she was in a wonderful costume and, and was very loud and uh, you know, practically breaking into song on her arrival. The people who came to there, they came from so many countries, from the east and west of the, of the Iron Curtain, and they didn't know each other, or very few knew each other in advance. So this meeting at uh, Hampstead Heath was a continuation of the Congress and the, the spirit of the Congress. Opre Roma! The Third General Assembly took the following decisions. The next Congress was to be held in Paris in 1973 with Juan Coruda 
elected as president of the permanent secretariat. The blue and green flag was adopted as a flag of the world Romani movement. The melody and new world of Jalem Jalem was adopted as the international Romani anthem. The first day of the Congress, 8th April, should be adopted as Roma Nation Day. <laughs> important because it laid the foundation stones for congresses after that. We've had a number of other congresses and each time we've moved ahead. More Romani people today know about who we are, what we are, than you 50 years ago. We are very proud of being a part of it, having given birth to this very, very important uh, e event. The feeling was that Roma were liberating themselves from the word Sigon. Sigan, Sigoin, all those words that had been demeaning and disrespectful for hundreds of years before. <laughs> Many comes to pen, the sort of folky, sort of Vamichal folky, the jowl, the tray, push the pot. What I hope will happen with this 21 Congress that uh, Roma will be able to find a new path to that dream. I'm going to use the word dream now of Baikapti, that it could be on the right road towards emancipation, a full emancipation as a Romani nation, a Romani nation without territory, without borders, but with the power of numbers to find a place in the world amongst the family of nations. Opre Roma! <laughs> Ah! Uh -huh.